Hello, everyone. Welcome back to SALT Talks. My name is John Darcy. I'm the Managing Director of SALT, which is a global thought leadership forum at the intersection of finance, technology, and public policy. The SALT Talks are a digital interview series that we started during the work from home period uh, to replicate the type of experience that we provide at our global SALT conference series. And what these are are really conversations with leading investors, creators, and thinkers. And what we're really trying to do is provide our audience a window into the minds of subject matter experts, as well as provide a platform for what we think are big ideas that are shaping the future. And we're very excited today to welcome Chris Toomey to SALT Talks. Uh, Chris is a partner of a top New York City-based private wealth management team that's affiliated with Morgan Stanley, and they manage around $5 billion in client assets. Their clients include high net worth individuals, family offices, foundations, and organizations, money management principals, institutional money managers, small cap banks, and offshore investors. Uh, Chris began his career at J.P. Morgan's private bank, and he was there until 1998 when he joined Lehman Brothers. Uh, he's held various positions throughout Morgan Stanley, transitioning from portfolio manager of uh, the government credit portfolio to building out Lehman's third-party long-only manager platform. As senior vice president, he was responsible for manager due diligence and often assisted in providing asset allocation and investment advice for private wealth clients. He joined Morgan Stanley Private Wealth in May of 2008. Uh, Chris has earned various distinctions, including membership in Morgan Stanley's President's Club. He was recognized by the Financial Times as one of the top 400 advisors and by Forbes Shook Top Wealth Advisors. Uh, he's spoken at several conferences about alternative investments, including the SALT Conference, Hedge World, and the Investment Institute. He's also appeared on CNBC's Squawk on the Street, Fox, Business's, Fox Business News' FBN AM show, as well as Wall Street Week. Uh, and he's also appeared uh, within Reuters as well. A reminder, if you have any questions for Chris during today's talk, you can enter them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your video screen. And hosting today's talk is Anthony Scaramucci, who's the founder and managing partner of Skybridge Capital, a global alternative investment firm. Anthony is also the chairman of SALT. And with that, I'll turn it over to Anthony for the interview. Let me unmute myself there. I'm sorry, I had myself muted because I've, I've got my kids in the background here, Chris. Okay, I've got a great room raider today, but I've also got kids outside shooting Nerf uh, bullets at me while we're speaking, so <laughs> apologize for that. But uh, let's go to your personal background for a second. You and I met probably 2005 or six. I think you were at Lehman at the time, if that's correct. Tell us uh, your, your early start. What were you thinking about being when you, when you grew up? As an example, John wanted to be a physicist, and of course, I wanted to be an astronaut. What did you want to be when you grow up, and how the hell did you end up in this business? Uh, well, thank you for having me. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, it's a big difference from being at SALT in Las Vegas. Um, and you're right, Anthony. Um, you know, we got to know each other very well during the integration between Newberger and Lehman Brothers. At the time, Lehman Brothers um, was growing out their asset management from the spinoff from Shearson about four years before that. And um, we acquired a bunch of different asset management companies, the last being Newberger Berman, uh, which also proved to be the biggest and probably one of the best. And so it was great getting to know you and working on that integration. Um, but to answer your uh, original question, um, you know, I, I went to uh, a small liberal arts school in upstate New York. Uh, I was an English major. I took my LSATs. And uh, I, I think like you, I was thinking about going into the law. Um, but before I went to law school, I figured I would intern uh, in New York at one of these white shoe uh, uh, law firms. And so I was doing interviews and um, a bunch of my friends who I had econ classes with uh, told me, you know, if you're gonna go down to New York, you might as well start interviewing with some of these banks. And at the time it was the nineties where Everybody was working hard and there's lots of money to be made. And I said, you know what, maybe I'll go work for an investment bank and, um, and see where that takes me. And if I want to go to law school, I'll go to law school. And, uh, you know, I got an opportunity to work at JP Morgan, uh, learning about uh, managing wealth for ultra high net worth families. Um, it was a very exciting time in the nineties, as you remember. And uh, from there, uh, I got an opportunity in, in 98 to go over to Lehman Brothers as I mentioned before, we're starting to build out an asset management business. And so at the time, it was a 150 year old firm, uh, but it was really feeling like a startup. I was employee number 11 of what became Lehman Brothers Asset Management. And uh, I guess the rest is history. 
Well, I mean, what I love about the story is that it, it was a sort of a weird arc to your career path, but you love what you do, obviously, because you're so good at it. So let, let's get into it. Uh, stock market is at an all-time high, having a good day today. Uh, it was down more than 30% in March, which we both know. Is the snapback justified, given the state of the economy? Uh, and if so, why? And where do we go from here, Chris? Yeah, I think um, that's a good point. Uh, we saw probably one of the quickest recessions we've ever seen with one of the quickest recoveries we've ever seen. If you look at the numbers, uh, the market did bottom in March 23rd. Um, initial claims peaked at the end of March at about 7 million. Uh, we also saw uh, the unemployment peak uh, around April. Retail sales bottomed in April, ISM bottomed in April. So we had that natural bottoming process that you would normally see uh, with a recession. It just happened very quickly. And the flip side to that is while we had a very, very difficult to store uh, GDP number in the second quarter, our expectations is that we'll get a very good one in uh, the third quarter. And so what is it? It's all basically about stimulus, right? So if you look at uh, 2019, federal tax receipts were about $3.4 trillion. If you take the four different stimulus bills combined, they equal about $3 trillion. So in that stimulus, we basically almost equaled all of the federal tax receipts that we normally take in in one year. And all that money was used to prop up the economy, keep people from uh, going into work and spreading the virus. Um, and it stimulated the economy and it stimulated the markets. And so I think, you know, putting money to work when the market was at 2200 was a little bit easier than putting it to work at 3500. Uh, but we think it's definitely justified and we think the market's going to continue to go higher. So let's talk about equities for a second, because you and I watch this stuff very carefully. The tech side of things, sort of like 10 to 15 names, Chris, have dramatically outperformed in the recent rally. Will that continue? Is value investing dead? Is passive investing ruling for the next decade? What do you, what do you make of what's going on? And, uh, and, and where do you see things in terms of the trends? So I think there's a reason why these tech companies have outperformed so dramatically. You know, one, uh, they're breaking paradigms, they're growing at astronomical rates, and they're changing the way that we do business. And, you know, as opposed to the period that I entered the market when, you know, everybody was chasing technology companies that weren't profitable, these companies are making tons of money. They've got pristine balance sheets. And there's a reason why you know, people are looking at them and saying, are these monopolies really good for the economy? Um, they've got impenetrable balance sheets. They're growing at uh, astronomical rates. And in a period where there's some real concern about what's going to happen because of COVID, it's become kind of a safe harbor trade. Um, so if you look at it, I think 25% of the return in the S&P 500 is driven by these names. I think it's about 50% with regards to the NASDAQ. Yeah, I think if you look at uh, what Mike Wilson's saying and our Global Investment Committee is saying, you know, these businesses are here to stay, but they're probably a little expensive here. And so I think you wouldn't, it wouldn't be a shock to me if I saw um, a bunch of these names starting to sell off for a variety of reasons. One, um, you know, depending on what your view is of the election, um, there is a high likelihood that we can see tax rates go higher. And so for that reason, you could see some investors taking some tax loss selling between now and the end of the year. And a lot of these investors have huge gains in these names. So you could see that providing some downward pressure. I also think you could probably see with uh, the proliferation of some of these new technology companies coming into market, where you've got a lower market cap, you've got higher growth rates, investors uh, taking some money away from their winners and looking to get into next year's or next decade's winners. I think the question with regards to value stocks, I think you got to look at what's driving those returns, right? So, you know, when you think of value, you think of defensive names, but, you know, a large majority of these indexes are basically financials driven. And as you know, coming out of the credit crisis, there was a tremendous amount of regulatory pressure put on banks. And so what you saw was 
while banks got very more, they got much better and more efficient with regards to using capital, they took their leverage down dramatically. So the return on equity has come down dramatically from prior to the credit crisis. And so that's been a drain with regards to financials ability to outperform and keep up with technology companies. Now, if we do get a normal V-shaped recovery, and from a cycle standpoint, we see uh, a regular cyclical type rally, which we're anticipating, um, part of that might include a situation where interest rates start going higher, you know, and I think we're in a situation where interest rates are at about, you know, we're at about 50 basis points. They were going towards 80 basis points and everybody was having a heart attack that rates were going higher. I don't necessarily think rates go back to normal, but I think they do go, uh, they do go higher. So I think there's a couple things that would drive the value trade. One is, do we get a, a cyclical rebound? Two, um, do financials uh, start to see improvement with regards to net interest margins? Um, and three, um, do we continue to see the economic growth that we've been expecting to see? Is there a scenario where the bottom part of the S&P, so right now it feels like it's the S&P 10 or the S&P 15, and then it's the S&P 485, but really the bottom part of the S&P, that sort of S&P 250 to 500 has really underperformed, Chris. Is there a scenario where it rotates and that starts to outperform? And if there is, what would be the catalyst? I think a catalyst would be that, that traditional V-shaped recovery so that you typically see the names that have underperformed like financials, energy, materials, um, consumer discretionary outside of a couple tech focused consumer discretionary names really starting to do well. And I think that is gonna be basically um, driven by two things. One, you know, we're getting a lot of results with regards to um, a vaccine and treatments uh, over the next four to eight weeks with regards to treating COVID. Secondly, is continued stimulus with regards to fiscal stimulus. Now we're in a situation right now uh, between the Democrats and the Republicans where originally we were thinking there would be some sort of compromise going into the election, anticipating maybe another stimulus bill of about a trillion dollars. The Democrats, are pushing for over $2 trillion. Um, and you're seeing everyone starting to ratchet down their estimates with regards to getting some sort of fiscal stimulus between now and the election. Our view is, is uh, we're probably uh, more leaning towards no stimulus before the election than stimulus before the election. Um, but our view is, is that uh, shortly after the election, we'll see some sort of stimulus between one and $2 trillion. I think that type of stimulus will continue to power us through um, uh, and continue to increase GDP. And we'll start to see some of those other sectors start to participate. Tell me, tell me you know, we're talking about a V-shaped recovery, but we've, we've already had a lot of time be expended, right? We've got six months of time that's been expended. Um, some people are talking about it's a K-shape, meaning some of us are doing well and some of us are doing less well. Uh, why are you still confident in a quote unquote V-shaped recovery? I just, I think it's because if you look at the data, the data is telling you that it's V-shaped. If you look at retail sales, um, we're seeing consistent growth in retail sales. If you look at personal savings, um, the consumer's actually in great shape going into COVID and their balance sheets have actually improved uh, during COVID just with regards to the stimulus checks that they're getting. If you look at the manufacturing, you're seeing manufacturing continue to pick up. Um, and if you look at places like Asia, and particularly in China, um, you've seen that they've actually recovered to pre-COVID levels. So our anticipation is we get to pre-COVID levels of GDP probably sometime in the second half of 2021. Um, and as such, that should be anticipated by the market and continue with the follow through. So while our base case right now on the S&P 500 doesn't provide a tremendous amount of upside on the S&P in general, our view is, is that there's gonna be opportunities to go well above our bull case if you look at different areas to take advantage of. When you were growing up in the business, as was I, we talked about asset allocation being 55-45, 60-40, depending on the person's age, 50-50, et cetera. 
But do you think the 60-40 model, the portfolio model of 60-40 is viable today, given where interest rates are? No, I think that's, a, that's the crux of, I think, asset allocation right now. Um, historically, uh, it was always about that base of fixed income where you were collecting a certain amount of cash flow and maturity was always going to provide you your principal back in return and that you took risk on the equity side of your allocation. Right now, if you look at the global debt market, about 85% of it yields less than 2%. So if you're a foundation, you're an endowment, you're an individual family that's looking to live off of your retirement assets and you're only making two and less percent on your fixed income, there's no way that you're gonna be able to meet those goals. And so I think what you're seeing is whether it's from a regulatory standpoint where regulators are saying, you know what, we need to provide high net worth investors and retail investors with options besides fixed income to provide that stability, to provide that cash flow, to offset the volatility of the equity market, or it's just the natural progression with regards to where people are putting assets. Um, you know, in our view, um, the traditional asset allocation has become very outdated and you need to start thinking differently. So, let, 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 let's stay on this for a second. Because we're in a huge low rate environment. Uh, you know, obviously stocks have gone up in that environment. Hedge funds have typically underperformed. Just pockets of them have done okay. But really since 2012, hedge funds have really not performed well. Uh, what role do you think hedge funds play in portfolios going forward? Yeah, look, I think there's a reason why hedge funds have underperformed since 2012, right? You saw a situation where a lot of money uh, was flowing into the space uh, and the pendulum kind of swung too hard. And you had a lot of people managing money that probably shouldn't have been managing money in the amounts of money that they were managing. And so it was only natural that you'd start to see those opportunities dry up and hedge funds underperform. What I would say is, is what we saw in 2008, 2009, um, during the global financial crisis, and what we saw coming through the COVID crisis was that our hedge funds for, by and large, did exceptionally well over this period. Whether you looked at macro, whether you looked at equity long short, whether you looked at multi-strat, um, with these periods of, of uncertainty, and this periods of volatility um, and really a dispersion between great companies and not so great companies, there was a real good opportunity to generate alpha. And in our view, we think that that's gonna continue and that you'll start to see continued amounts of capital flowing into the hedge fund space. So one part of that market though, on the hedge fund side, structured credit did not do well during the crisis. So. Uh, what happened there? What do you think happens there? And what do you say to your clients about that? Yeah, I mean, look, I think it was a very scary time, very similar to global financial crisis. When you're at dinner and you're receiving calls from friends on desks, uh, friends at hedge funds, hearing rumors about this hedge fund's going under, that hedge fund's going under, this hedge fund's over levered. Um, and then when the banks came in and changed the margin requirements on a lot of this paper, we knew that there was going to be a bloodbath. And, you know, I think you noticed this as well as I did when uh, the Treasury Secretary is doing a press conference and talking about uh, on the run treasuries versus off the run treasuries. You knew they were looking exactly at where the heart of this problem was, which was over levered players and structured credit. And what I'll tell you is, is it's the old adage, you know, um, uh, you could be right, um, but with the leverage, um, you might not be uh, around long enough to see being right. And so a, a big part of this, I think, is was leverage in the space. I think a big part of this was players that shouldn't have been in the space. Um, and the space had to have a shakeout. And so we saw that shakeout. Um, and, you know, it was painful for a lot of those players, but that pain provides opportunity for us going forward. And so for in our minds, um, if you've got exposure to structured credit, if you're looking to get exposure to structured credit, it's probably one of the few places in the bond market that is still attractive. And what I would say, though, is, is I would be very selective with regards to how you play it, really looking at um, uh, diversifying into uh, managers and funds uh, that have a long, extensive history of being able to manage 
in that space, understand what the risks are. Many of these pieces of paper are very esoteric and you really need to know what you own. And then they also have to have the wherewithal and the ability to withstand a potential pullback, right? You know, we still haven't seen the stimulus come through that we're expecting. Um, at some point, uh, there's gonna be a talk with regards to a double dip recession. If the economy continues to kind of mull along, we don't have a vaccine and uh, we don't have stimulus. Um, and so in that type of situation, um, you really wanna make sure you've got a manager that's not necessarily selling into those markets, but taking advantage of that weakness. So, I, you know, we've both been doing this a long time. This is my 32nd year doing this. Um, I find that high net worth individuals, which I have been managing money for high net worth individuals for 32 years, uh, and we had Morgan Hazel on who, who talked about the psychology of money. I find that people get very emotional with their money, and ju justifiably so. I'm not saying otherwise, but it seems the best strategy is to be unemotional. And so when sharp sell-offs take place, if the fundamentals are okay, it sort of makes sense either to add money there or to stay patient. So have you found that to be the case with your clients? And if you have, what psychological things do you do to help your clients through those things or to think about these things in a contrarian way? Yeah, look, I think, it's, I think it's the crux of what we do, which is providing our clients with the right advice at the right time. And, you know, you know, while you've been in the business a little bit longer than I have, you know, we've been seeing one crisis after don't, another. Don't, don't rub it into me. Okay? I said the, a little bit. I said a little bit. <laughs> the conversation was going great up until that moment. All of a sudden, the conversation it, got a little disturbing. It, it, don't rub it in. In fairness, it. we've seen quite a few uh, crises over our time in the market. Um, and in each of those, we've come out of them. And we've seen the guys that have been able to take advantage of those, those uh, pullbacks. And in many cases, it's all about having a plan and being disciplined. So when you're talking to your clients and you're talking about what you're trying to achieve, in certain situations, when markets are elevated, when things are going along as they should, there isn't a whole lot to do. But when you do see those periods where the market sells off 30%, that's why we're here. That's why we've got cash. This is why we want to rebalance our portfolio. You want to have something that's doing well when the market's selling off. So you have some dry powder to put into these markets that have become uh, cheap and that you want to get exposure to. And so, you know, the good news is we left Lehman Brothers about 120 days before the bankruptcy. Um, we brought in a lot of new business during the global financial crisis, and we did exceptionally well for a lot of these clients. And when COVID hit and the markets sold off about 30%, uh, we were ready. We went back to the same playbook in 08, 09, and our clients were prepared for it. And so they were, you know, you know holding their noses like we were in some situations because you know, you, you don't know when you're going to pick the bottom, um, but you know that the probability is at those times um, that you're going to get a really good return by doing the right thing. Well, I mean, let's talk about that because you, you, you had a pandemic, 1918 pandemic, uh, 100 plus years go by. We have another pandemic. You did have the financial crisis. It seemed like a dress rehearsal, frankly, for the pandemic, but but you, you, your portfolio construction ideas and your view of risk management have been changed by the pandemic? Or are you unchanged? Like what, what does the pandemic say to you about where you need to be from a risk management perspective? Or does it not say anything and just say it chalk it up to it being a meteor strike? No, I, look, I think it's one of the things what we have to be prepared for. We have to be prepared for the, the unknown, known, unknown. Um, and this is a situation where, you know, who knew we were going to have this, this crisis coming. And so you need to make sure that you build portfolios that can withstand some of these pullbacks and that you're going to have the capital and the wherewithal with regards to take advantage of those cheaper prices and take advantage of that opportunity. Um, so I think what it did was it just reinforced the fact that you need to stick to your knitting. You still need to have a plan in place uh, because these things are going to occur. They've been occurring probably every seven to eight years. Um, and if you're not prepared um, and know what you should be doing, you're going to miss them or you're going to make a mistake. Um, 
I'd say the difference with regards to COVID versus GFC is the fact that interest rates now are so low. And um, just having kind of a 60-40 portfolio or having some long duration fixed income in your portfolio um, was really gonna be helpful in each of these situations. But now that rates are so low, you're not necessarily getting that reward that you used to get when the market sold off. And so you really have to start thinking differently. And so what it did is it really is accelerating um, our asset allocation decisions in investing in other things like hedge funds in private credit in private equity um, and in places like real estate. And so um, getting um, some real stability on the other side of your portfolio with those types of asset classes, I think is really necessary just given the lack of opportunity on the fixed income front. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Dorsey. He's been dying to ask you a few questions. We got a lot of questions in the queue, and you got a tremendous amount of participation today, Christopher. So I'm impressed with that. And uh, let's turn it over to John Dorsey, who's going to try to outshine you and me now. So <laughs> get ready to me. Get ready. Of course. So I want to build on, uh, you've alluded to this a couple times, and you just mentioned that again, the idea of trying to drive returns outside of you know, the traditional core fixed income part of your portfolio. And even now with equities having rallied back to highs, uh, trying to drive returns elsewhere, we have a question about private equity, you know, whether it's direct co-investment or indirect and, and the, the need to have private equity in your portfolio to try to juice returns a little bit in this low interest rate environment. How much private equity is typical today or should be typical in a balanced portfolio? And what sort of a max percentage of a portfolio that you would recommend you know, the average client, obviously every client is different. I don't want to paint it with too broad a strokes, but uh, within a high net worth individual's portfolio, let's say, what's the max percentage of private equity and what's the role uh, in the portfolio of that private equity allocation? No, I think that's a very good question. And as I think you, you, you hit on, um, every client's different and every client situation is different. And so when we're talking to our clients, we've got um, a, a general consensus within our investment committee with regards to uh, if we had a clean slate and we had no variables to worry about, what would that model portfolio look like? Um, invariably though, you know, our clients don't have a clean slate. They own businesses. They have their own direct investments. They have their own uh, return and risk parameters. And for that reason, um, you know, we have to take those things into consideration when we're looking at um, how we build a portfolio for them um, and making sure that we don't have outsized risk within one area of the portfolio um, and not providing the type of uh, balance that you need. Um, I think when you think about private equity, I think you need to think about it as a commitment, right? Because um, it takes a long time to put that money to work. It takes a long time for that money to get harvested. Um, and you want to diversify against what we call vintage year risk. And so there's certain vintages um, where there were great opportunities and you got great returns. And there's certain years or certain vintages where the opportunities were not as great. And so what I would say is, is that broad based private equity right now um, is not an area that we think is very attractive. Um, there's about $2.2 trillion of cash sitting on private equity balance sheets, waiting to get put to work. Um, and, um, you know, the market is still, uh, if you look at it from a valuation standpoint, um, uh, pretty highly valued. Um, now, you've got the flip side of that of interest rates being relatively low. Um, so financing these deals becomes a little bit more attractive. Um, in addition to that, as Anthony mentioned before, a lot of this performance has been um, concentrated into a couple areas um, in the tech space. But if you look at the S&P right now, about the average stock, I think, is down about 8 to 10 percent. So there are opportunities out there. And so what I would say is, is within this kind of um, uh, period, uh, we would say the opportunity in private equity is probably below average. Um, and so we wouldn't necessarily be aggressively allocating broadly um, to private equity funds, um, but we would maintain that commitment. And so that commit can be anywhere from 5% of a, a, a liquid uh, portfolio to as much as uh, in some cases 30 or 40%. Um, if you take into uh, some of our clients who have direct businesses um, where they own uh, a private business, you know, that can be north of 50%. And so what I would say is, is it's all about making the right blend 
and taking advantage of the opportunities that are there. What I would say is actually uh, a place that we think is actually even more interesting is owning uh, publicly listed alternative managers. So if you look at that, um, those alternative managers have the benefit of sitting on $2.2 trillion worth of cash. Um, we're in a, a period uh, which might be one of the greatest opportunities that we've seen in distressed investing of all time. Um, many of these companies are growing at over 15% um, and have a dividend yield more than the S&P 500. So, you know, what we would probably be doing is investing in less private equity funds and probably investing alongside them and owning their own stock. That's an interesting way to look at it. Um, pivoting to real estate for a moment. So, you know, a lot of what we've talked about with COVID is that it's accelerated trends that were already in place in terms of digital work, uh, things of that nature. But there's also been some situations where it's reverse trends that were in place, in particular with urban real estate and especially urban commercial real estate. Um, what's your view on the real estate market? What are areas that you think are beaten down that might be a good place for opportunistic asset allocation? In general, how do you uh, teach clients to access the real estate market? And what's your view of the space as a whole in terms of what segments of the market are attractive and unattractive? Yeah, we think real estate is actually a very attractive place to be invested right now. Um, outside of um, what you read about constantly um, in the press about, um, you know, the issues that New York is having in San Francisco and some of the other large money center areas uh, that were probably expensive going into COVID. And then, as you mentioned, are now dealing with some of these new trends with regards to work from home um, and remote working. Um, but I think if you look at it right now, um, right now we're building uh, less homes on an annualized basis than the 1950s, and the population's increased about 62%. We're in a situation where um, three-month inventory is increased to over six months. It's the lowest, le it's the highest level since uh, 1963. Um, so there's no inventory. Um, we're not building as many houses, and you're in a situation where millennials are leaving the home and looking to move into a new house or a new apartment and mortgage rates are at all time lows. So it's a very attractive um, opportunity for multifamily housing. We also are seeing um, uh, a migration of, of people from the north into the south um, and there aren't enough office buildings in those locations. And so what we're typically also seeing is some real opportunity in office in the right locations. Uh, so now broadly speaking, office is going to have some issues, particularly um, uh, in the Northeast and in some areas of California. Um, but we also see some opportunities in office, um, particularly in the South. Uh, we also like triple net lease uh, opportunities. Um, and so there are a variety of opportunities outside of your own home, outside of owning um, a publicly traded REIT uh, where you can get diversified exposure into some of those markets um, in a thoughtful way, where you're in a situation where even with COVID, um, uh, rental collections and lease collections are at average or above average collections. Um, and so you're, you've got uh, high quality assets, you've got good cash flows. In many cases, you also might have a situation where um, you also um, have certain tax benefits built into that. So we're not accountants, we're not tax experts, um, but there are some benefits for taxable investors um, owning real estate um, and depending on what type of vehicle you own. So your team services a wide constituency of high net worth clients, individuals, institutions. What are some new trends that you're seeing among potentially next generation uh, high net worth investors in terms of what they're looking for from their investments. So the question I believe is leading towards it. Do you see more of a tilt towards things like ESG and impact? And how do you quantify those when you're building a portfolio for an investor? Yeah, I mean, look, I think ESG has been around for decades. I just think people probably haven't talked about it. And I think um, the millennials have really made it um, uh, a key point with regards to how they invest, that it's not just about profits, about you know, what these companies are doing to make the world a better place. Um, and what you're seeing is, is I think with uh, COVID and people being more thoughtful with regards to how their money is being managed, it again is accelerating these trends. Um, 
And what we're also seeing is more and more opportunities to uh, take advantage of these ESG mandates. And, you know, look, I don't know uh, for a fact that this is true, but if you look at value indexes, they've been underperforming um, growth indexes for some time. You know, there is a larger proportion of energy and materials and value uh, indexes, and there is not a lot of value in material uh, investments and in ESG uh, mandates. And so um, that could be one of the reasons why you're seeing a little bit more of a divergence between growth and value. Yeah, so um, the chicken and the egg, you know, wh which one is it? Is it the fact that demand fell off a cliff while supply, obviously with the OPEC situation, uh, deteriorated for markets? Or is it, is it what you're talking about? And it, and it very well could be both, right? So it could be a situation where, you know, we came out of the global financial crisis while markets have done well. It's been probably one of the weakest economic recoveries out of uh, a big pullback like we've seen. Um, so you don't have that tremendous amount of demand uh, for energy that you had going into it. And you're not in a situation where you're having a hard time finding supply. Um, and so that's definitely got to be a weight with regards to energy companies. But I think ESG is also going to have an effect on that, um, on the energy and material side, but also on the industrial side um, and just in general companies, uh, broadly speaking. Uh, I think it also is seen um, with regards to a real focus in on some of these newer growth companies. Um, you're seeing um, what we call kind of the next fang. Uh, we put out a report a couple months ago, about 25 names, um, you know, about $155 billion worth of market cap, uh, growing at over 10%, peg ratio is less than two. Um, and since the market's bottom, we're actually, the next fangs are actually outperforming the fangs. Um, and I think part of this is the fact that there's more opportunity there. A lot of these technologies, a lot of these opportunities are getting pulled forward um, and people are looking to take advantage of that. So last question before we let you go, um, you're affiliated with Morgan Stanley, a great firm. And I know we have a lot of high net worth individuals within the SALT community who tune into these talks. If somebody was a free agent out there right now, a high net worth individual or an institution, and they're shopping around for a financial advisor, why would they want to work with a group affiliated with a, a firm like Morgan Stanley with, with its resources and its depth of knowledge? Make your pitch to a prospective uh, client. Well, thank you. I mean, it's what I do every day. Uh, but You're pretty look, good we're, at it. We're, we're, uh, we're a $7 billion uh, wealth management team. Um, we basically could, could do whatever we want. We could, we could go independent. We could go work for another bank. We've made it, uh, a conscious decision to do what's the best thing for our clients, which is work at Morgan Stanley. Um, from a technology spend around cybersecurity and just making things easier for our clients um, to the amount of um, a scale that we have built into our business, to our partnerships with regards to third-party asset management man uh, companies, um, the product that's available to us, um, and most importantly, um, just being able to uh, do the business that we do and provide the advice that we provide. Um, during the, the COVID crisis, you know, operating from 30,000 feet was not going to work. You really needed to look at what was going on at the ground level uh, from uh, things as, as nuanced as uh, on-the-run treasuries versus off-the-run treasuries, to what's going on in the securitized credit market, to what's going on with regards to margin loans and margin uh, reserve requirements. Um, and so being a part of an investment bank that has a strong capital markets influence that's providing us information with regards to what's going on on the ground level, and then having the deep relationships with some of the greatest investors um, the world has known, um, provides us kind of that top-down and bottom-up uh, uh, information flow that really provides customized solutions for our clients. So, well, I'm sold, but uh, Anthony, <laughs> I want to leave you a final word before I mean, we let Chris go. That was a ridiculously easy question. What you should have asked them is who's going to win the next election. That's what you should ask. Them. Okay. That was a ridiculously easy question, but you don't have to answer that to me. I'm sure there's Morgan Stanley com compliance that would be, putting you in a bad spot. We, we appreciate I, you coming on. I want a question for you, Anthony. Yeah, go ahead. All right. So the SALT conference takes place in, in Las Vegas, Nevada in May. 
Will yeah. there be a SOLP conference in May of this coming year? Uh, no, probably not, unfortunately. I, I don't see how we could do that given the guidelines and what we know from the World Economic Forum and the Milken Institute and so forth. Uh, could we have an event in September? I think so. I think that's possible. Uh, I'll turn it back to John Darcy and uh, he could be more declarative about it. The number one thing for us, Chris, is we want to make sure everybody's safe and, and healthy. And so that's a priori. I don't think we can get that done by May. If I thought we could, we certainly would have it in May. John, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, just reiterating what Anthony said, the public health guidance that we've gotten is that the first half of 2021 is going to be challenging for large in-person gatherings. And we love doing this SALT Talk series. It's been great to stretch the content out over the course of several months as opposed to jamming it into three days in Las Vegas, even though Las Vegas might be a little bit more fun than, than Anthony sitting at home in his cargo shorts and his, uh, his blazer. But, um, you know, we're anticipating doing a, another in-person gathering uh, likely in the second half of 2021. We have a few tricks up our sleeve, and we'll, we'll make that announcement probably in the next couple months about what that event is going to look like. Uh, but for the time being, we're, we're engaged in, in uh, virtual events and content the way everybody else is. And, you know, it's, it's been a learning experience for everybody, and we've really, really enjoyed all the conversations we've been able to have, including with you. I appreciate the opportunity. I look forward to – Seeing you guys in Vegas sooner rather than later. Absolutely. Be well, Chris. See you soon. Thank Great you. Great job. All right. All the best.